Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team podcast, connecting Kill Team communities across the globe. If you're passionate about the tactical skirmish game that brings together strategy, lore, and creativity, you are in the right place. Don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe, and stay updated with our latest episodes. If you want to support the show, check out our Patreon. Your support means a lot to us. Follow us by using the social media links in the podcast description for all the latest news, and be sure to leave a review to let us know what you think. Thanks for tuning in. Here's today's episode. Welcome back, everybody, for another week of Just Another Kill Team podcast. We've got special guests after Nova, where we met up for the first time with a uh, Mountainside Tabletop. Hey, hey. what's up, y'all? Welcome, One welcome, HP gang in the chat, <laughs> Compendium <Yeah>. gangs. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, right off the bat, I want to hear about y'all's experience at Nova. Uh, it yeah, great. it was it was really good. It was uh, it was our first time going to kind of one of these big cons, and uh, yeah, it was awesome. Just being around so many people that are so into this stuff, I found it like really motivating and energizing, and obviously cool to cool to meet some people and put you know faces to voices and that sort of thing as well. Yeah, it was kind of like being in the internet. There were so many, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so many internet personalities that I recognized, but you know they were all in the same place. So yeah, Nova wild. is Nova is one of those ones. I think LVO is also like that, where a lot of the Warhammer community kind of shows up in the same spot, and those are like the two big tent poles, one on the east coast, one on the west coast. So if you go to either of those, and if any listeners go to any of those, you do generally see a lot of the internet content creation space in one spot for our hobby. Yeah. Yeah. So meeting lots of people. Um and I played in uh one of the days of the narrative war cry event, which was very cool. Um had some great games there. Got to um run my Wilder Core Hunters, which I had painted up a while ago and then never played with, which is like insane for me to do that. But finally I got to on the table, so that was fun. I played in a uh, budget commander event and then uh, an after hours game of kill team, both of which I won, so I can say that I left Nova undefeated, which feels pretty good. Jeez. <laughs> wow. <laughs> how is how you know is Warcry actually? You know? It it was great. I was saying on the before we go to Warcry, on the topic of being undefeated, you should go to every con and play a <laughs> uh, play a fixed game of rock, paper, scissors in the parking lot. Yeah. And then you can say you're like a worldwide undefeated player, totally. you know. But no, Warcry was really fun. Um so they had two days of this Warcry narrative event. Uh, I could only do the Saturday, but it, it was a lot of fun. I had, I think, one of my best games of Warcry that I've ever played. And I'm not talking about skill. I'm talking about pure bloodshed. Um, and it was, it was the Will of Corps. For yeah, anyone who doesn't well, know, the Will of Corps are like the dog, the dog guys in Warcry. Yeah, so I had my hunting pack with some dogs. And then I had a couple of... Uh, sylvaneth allies that i brought in so it was like the forest rangers bringing the forest as well so it's kind of thematic there yeah it was yeah good. that's definitely something that kill team doesn't get really get to do because our teams are kind of fixed and list yeah. building has kind of gone away so Warcry, you can do a little bit more list building and jason's done a little bit in the past but i don't really know if he's still actively playing Warcry at this point yeah i mean i've definitely dabbled in some i've built a few different lists um you know i've i've dropped in on a few game nights and Warcry is super fun um there's last it time is. i checked there's a decent scene here in minnesota as well that's cool i mean this is so funny like of course like we're on a kill team podcast and the first thing we do is talk about Warcry. but um <laughs> one thing i really like about it is that the compendium is uh very much as viable as any of the bes bespoke stuff and so there's just like there's so much variety you kind of never uh never get bored there's something for everyone in it yeah and Warcry is definitely a better i think beer and pretzels games because there's really sure. not that much crunchiness to it you like move no, in you roll your dice and you hit them so unlike yeah. kill team where there's a couple layers there's re-rolls there's strap ploys <clears throat> equipment all this other stuff when you go to war cry it's really just list building and then rolling one set of dice from what i remember yeah yeah for sure it scratches a different itch yeah 
Yeah, I'm a huge sucker for the theme uh, as well. So, like, the the Warcry band that I had was uh, Slaves to Darkness. So I had to have seven models, and I wanted some uniformity. Uh, so it was, like, uh, Mark of Nurgle for everything, seven models. I had six warriors and a horse guy, and I gave them all durability upgrades to, like, nice. to represent the Mark of Nurgle, basically. And, uh, you know, it's just, it was cool. It played surprisingly well, and it was fun and thematic. Yeah, it's War too bad that good. we can't really talk about chaos stuff all that much because, as far as previews go in War Warcom, we're at Eldari and in Imperials for yeah, the new edition of Kill Team right? at the time of recording. Yeah, yeah. I'm assuming but, by the time uh, that we hear this, we're gonna see all the other ones, but we don't know what they are yet. We have yeah. Eldari and Imperials. Speaking, speaking to everybody from the past, we've only got Eldari and Imperial. How are we feeling about so f the changes we've seen so far? Well, as a uh, so Brad hates elves, and I love. Yep. The Eldar. So I got all of those teams from the last edition, and I'm thrilled. I think they all look great. Um, yeah, the big change, seven inch movement. The seven inch movement is just like it's it's awesome, right? It's going to be so good. Uh, all the corsairs with their baked in dash, like you know, ten inch movement sounds uh, pretty awesome to me. On every activation, I can't wait to can't wait to try them out and look at the uh, full rules and it looks like uh, hand of the archon got a pretty significant buff too right they get pain tokens now just by injuring something um yeah that's true that anyway. is a it is much closer to just moving not moving really controlling things like three apl operative because depending on how the actual wording goes because the new power from pain for any listeners who don't know is if you injure someone you get to steal some pain which is nice and you can use an invigoration right away, so it's mm -hmm. during the operative's activation, before or after it performs an action, which is the same thing as guard. So right after you hit someone, you have a window to generate an APL. And then until the start of the operative's next activation, you add one to its APL stat, which means for control, you instantly turn into a three APL operative, even if you don't get that extra action, which is kind of yeah. wild. Totally. Oh, man. Totally. I think... Yeah, go ahead. I hadn't even like read into like that much of it, but like that means you can do this risky thing of like charge uh, a point and like you can't steal it until you have that pain token, so you have to fight. But like fighting someone is dangerous, and like yep. these elves just are here for the danger. I love that. Yeah, it depends. I honestly, I don't a hundred percent know right now because depending on how the rules are written, maybe you get that action right away. It could be that they clean up the language where if your APL changes mid action, you get to do a thing. But if things are the way they are in this current edition, the APL game would happen next turn. So you would be three APL for control throughout the turn, which is already a pretty big change, I think. And then you would gain it in the beginning of next turn for you to actually be a little mini Marine. Yeah, it's uh, it's really going to change how they play, which is interesting. I, I hope that that's indicative of like just all the changes that we're going to see, you know, small tweaks that really like just change the feeling of the team i think is uh more of that and i'll be really happy going into the next edition it does it does seem like mandrix basically make it into the new edition almost exactly the same visibly <laughs> yeah totally i mean i think they came so late in this edition like obviously they were made with third edition in mind. Been. there's no way yeah. there's no way they could have been writing this team without thinking like maybe we won't change it all that much for the next edition it makes me sad because I bet, you know, Void Dancers will probably just keep their flip belts and not get fly back. Yeah, that's definitely very possible. Blades <laughs> yeah. of Cain did get a pretty nice little change with the Rune of Prophecy. It's no longer fudging by one. It's fudging yeah. by D3, which is can basically just mean that you're guaranteed to get it or guaranteed to not get it. Which yeah. now that the you get a command point based on if you go first or second, if you play defensively enough, maybe you do want to go second and let your opponent overextend now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, uh, you know, it's funny that that small change, just like, well, it's a pretty big change, I guess, but uh, giving something to not winning initiative. I love that. Of all the changes we've seen so far, I think that's one of my favorite. Uh, it really, really helps the uh, feels bad of losing initiative turning point three and like losing the game on the spot. <laughs> yeah. It might be kind of fun on your guys's YouTube channel where now that extra CP, you can say a like loser CP whenever you get to use an extra CP. Like, <laughs> yeah, ah, totally. That would yeah. be kind of fun. So Brad, I take it then that you're more interested in the Inquisition side since Vic is out here sporing the elves and their seven <laughs> inches of movement. Yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, if 
if Victor is the elf guy, I'm the dwarf guy. So I'm excited for that article to come out. But in terms of the uh, Imperial teams that we've seen, we've seen some fun stuff. I think one thing that caught my eye was, so the Novitiates got previewed, right? Yep. And um, it looks like there's some slight changes to faith points. But one thing in particular that I thought looked pretty fun, and I don't think it's going to be good. Don't get me wrong. I don't think this is going to be like a go-to strat. But for the fun points... Um, the, like the auto chastiser, I think it's called. Now, yeah, if I'm remembering correctly, you deal damage to your own guy to be able to get to use a faith point for free for uh, active you faith get to or use, You get to hit yourself for one to three chastises so that you can use one to three faith points, basically, it's depending like, on how painful you want this chastising to be. One faith like, point I just think, per wound? Yeah, dealing damage to yourself always feels good to me. <laughs> like, I think that'll be fun. I don't think it's going to win me a lot of games, but I do think it will make for some memorable moments. And, uh, you know, I'm kind of all about that. So, I yeah, think I think fun. right now the biggest faith point spend you can do is three to convert a fail into a critical or some version of hitting a critical when you're not supposed to if i remember correctly there is a three faith option so i wonder if we're gonna get a brand new table or if the table is gonna remain much the same yeah i don't know uh, uh it's, retain one of your normals as a crit so you just smack yourself for three make sure that the crack grenade or the viscerator does the full six or five damage I, mean, I would do that every time, you know. Why not? <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of hoping there's like one little like low key thing that slightly tones down that uh, blinding aura or whatever that thing's called. Like yeah. I don't know, yeah. like because it's such an identity of the team, it's got to stick around. But just like doing something that slightly tweaks it to to tone it down a little bit would be really nice. Because it could be you know, nice if it's just obscurity now, because that you know obscurity is pretty powerful. Or maybe it could be a version yeah. of like a smoke grenade instead of it being you can't shoot me now. It's like you do shoot me but oh, it's be awesome. probably not going to do all that much. And that would give teams with higher AP weaponry another avenue to actually attack the team. To be fair, they did get tapped pretty hard on a nerf because they hit on fours now instead of on threes, I assume. Right. Well, I was going to say, based on I... what we saw, what they've done to the uh, Kasserkin, they're not afraid to like totally change the team's identity. Um, you know, I think everything's on the table, right? Like that seems like a ground up rewrite from what we saw yeah. in that article. If they don't, yeah, unless they hit elite points somewhere in the in the fine print yeah. there. I, it does feel like yeah. they just have a whole different play style. Because now they hit on threes, and I don't think you can hit on threes while also having elite points and pretend to be a fair team. Especially with Severe. <laughs> yeah. Like, hitting on threes, you've got Severe and elite points. Like, hitting on threes and Severe both, like, both basically just accomplish what elite points were accomplishing already. So having all of that would just make them insane. Remind me what severe does. I don't know the. I can't remember the keywords yet. Severe is if you don't retain any crits, you can upgrade one of your normals to a crit. Uh, okay. Yeah. But it's only right against there. ready operatives. So it looks like in the strategic gambit phase, you get to say light them up, and then if you shoot someone who's ready, you get to get severe. So hitting on threes with severe, you go in with like the new plasma profile, and that could be really good because you're just gonna guaranteed doink someone. Right. Is part oh. of the ploy that you have to say light him up? You gotta look at your opponent and say light him up. It's like uh, yeah. Rainer from StarCraft, you know? <laughs> That's like his go-to line. It's Never like, played it. He's basically a space marine. It's basically 40k. He anyway. is, yeah, he is a space marine. I think, yeah. you know, the old, the old idea of the Terran space marines being just oh, space marines but prisoners was probably not untrue at the time. Yeah, the big... Uh, which came first, 40k or StarCraft? Definitely 40k, right? It's definitely 40k, I think, yeah. And yeah. then StarCraft came a little later. I think there were ideas that Blizzard maybe was supposed to make some 40k game, but from what I understand, those are just rumors and there's nothing, never anything confirmed. As far as, like, the Inquisition agents go, they're maybe the only way for you to be able to play some version of Compendium going forward because they still have... The Sisters oh, of yeah. Silence and the Depesta Scions added on to that preview. So I assume they're still there. Obviously, those teams are going away by every yeah. account that GW has given us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can't like I did a quick scan of the Inquisitors. Like there wasn't 
Was there any big changes? Any headlines? I can't remember. I think the idea of a floating servo skull is a huge right. change as far as like a thing that you can do. So the idea that equipment is now on every operative simultaneously, but you can only right. use them once per turning point. I think in the stream, they talked about grenades. Here we see the servo skull. That is going to fundamentally change how people approach certain matchups. Because right now in a game, you're like, this guy, he's got yeah. a crack grenade. Be afraid of him, especially with the way crack grenades currently work. So the idea that a servo skull can float around and just do a mission action for one AP less, that's going to be really big, especially with the idea that there's going to be fewer objective markers, probably. Yeah, absolutely. Have we seen the stats on crack grenades yet? Uh, I think we've seen... I think we've seen smoke and stuns on the preview stream, and that's all we've got. So I'm assuming crack grenades are still going to be good. Yeah, probably. Yeah. It's hard to make four or five damage bad. Yeah, no kidding. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, because it doesn't look like we've changed wound counts really. So a seven wound operative catching a crack grenade is still gonna nuke them just as hard in the new edition as it currently does. Yeah, talking Go about ahead. how things are changing over, you know, we got a lot of news about the classification of teams, and because you know we're coming from different spheres of the kill team area, I'm kind of curious how is Mountainside feeling about the idea of classification. I um, love it. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm. I don't love it, but I'm 100 percent unbothered by it. Like, I, I definitely understand how it could be frustrating to people, but I also feel like not well over 99 percent of kill team games played in the world don't need to be concerned about whether or not they're classified. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of uh, upset people that think their team is going to legends. And it's like, it's not that, right? Like teams are continuing to get rules updates. And so I think like, if you're not playing it, you know, Nova or LVO or the US Open, like it doesn't matter to you. Uh, people are of course entitled to be upset by, you know, whatever they want to be upset by. But, you know, ever since the news came out, it kind of has felt like, you know, for us anyway, like, you know, great, whatever. It, it really, it doesn't change Really yeah, for you guys, for you guys can just keep recording with the same unclassified teams or classified teams. But this is still like for us for a game yeah. that's only like effectively three years old. Like the other thirty three percent of the time, you know, then we'll have some teams declassify. But if the teams actually do keep getting rules updates all the way through like six years of gameplay, like does it really matter at the end of the day? Yeah, absolutely. And like, are you expecting that every tournament will now be classified only? Um, I know for the GW ones, I would kind of expect it, but by the time that GW, rotation, yeah, for sure. by the time that rotation happens or the classification happens, we will have, I assume, basically one whole year of this current edition releasing. And if that's the case, we go from thirty-three teams, we lose ten-ish teams, and then we get mm-hmm. another six. So it's like twenty, you know, like twenty-six-ish teams. Like, is that really the end of the world? I don't think so, especially at a big tournament. There's a lot that you have to manage anyways. And I know for a lot of players, especially even hearing at these larger tournaments, like I've helped to run Tacoma, I've run, you know, New York Open, gone to Nova. A lot of people who come from local meta still say like, oh, I've never seen these teams. And that can be a big, that can be a big problem for a competitive game. It's like if you've never seen someone and you're experiencing all the rules for the first time, that can be rough. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I've got two things to throw in about the classified thing. The first, they we've already seen that, like they did it to the compendium. They just didn't announce it. Um, so I think I compendium mean, is even harsher. Like as long as they don't do what they're doing compendium, where they just like remove them wholesale, it's fine. Yeah, but like throughout Kill Team twenty twenty one, they just like stopped updating compendium, and I guess they didn't like say they're not allowed at tournaments, but like they weren't ever really hardly going to do well enough to like win big tournaments. And then, like, the small tournaments would be, like, the unclassified ones anyways, and they would do okay there, and that's all, like, fine and dandy. And that's, like, not any different than the arc of Kill Team 2021 with, like, the compendium basically becoming unclassified. Um, But now they just, like, told us they're doing that. So, really, it's the only difference is they told us what they've already been doing. Well, and didn't they say, like, I might be remembering incorrectly, but in the article, didn't it say that they would continue to get quarterly balance updates yeah i think like, they did regardless of classification. Our, real, 
the real question for us is in a year if it still feels like those teams are still getting touched but considering right. that commandos which are you know, like eight percent of the meta even to this day are still are they really floating around they're they're pretty high up there yeah, like, they're way on the week to week basis they're almost always at five percent or more which is kind of insane when we have 30 or basically like 40 playable teams if we're throwing in whatever compendium currently is the fact that commandos still see that much play i'd be very surprised that come a year come three years from now when commandos are like unclassified if they don't just re-release them with more tweaks yeah the thing with compendium is like i you know i really enjoyed compendium not from a gameplay perspective but from an accessibility perspective like you know it's great getting people into the game to say like just whatever army you have like people that are already in warhammer right it's like whatever army you have, like the troops probably fit into this somewhere, right? And just to like get them in the door. And now, you know, people are a purchase away from having a team. Um, but from a gameplay perspective, like it was never the same thing, right? Like playing a compendium team never, like, it, well, you know, right at the beginning, I guess. But like after, let's say, Morak, the gulf became pretty wide. Yeah, in terms of what you could actually do uniquely, Compendium was never really in the spot to be unique. There were certainly powerful rules and more than enough for you to actually play games and feel competitive. But as Mm -hmm. far as climbing the top of the table, you're facing down Felgors who have literally 50% more health and damage output than anything you can do. That's always Didn't Custodes win LVO a couple years ago? Kill Team Open. That was a fully in the dark tournament. (laughs) And Uh, it turns out that Five Sisters with Creeping Dread and yeah. injury bubble and two big custodians <laughs> with shields you and could play crazy. recon stand in the corner and force your opponent to come to you and they're and like that was, that crazy was group activating like double activate on doors oh yeah right the chain activation where you like switch between them yeah that's right yeah, yeah. you go into just like an anime cut scene and then they just yeah. wreck your day <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i mean even that like that was like someone discovered a trick right it's not like the team was built for that you know someone Found an exploit. GW willing, if they release a Custodes team that will be part of the DNA of the team, a flexible breach and clear, but just for sisters and Custodes. Because, you know, I I do feel for some of the players on the compendium side who are are saying, like, you know, this is my team kind of Mm -hmm. fading off into the distance. Custodes, Grey Knights, Tyranids probably being the big ones with really no real representation in the current game. But I would expect that there's that you know those things will change i would be my expectation like there's no way that gw if they get to rearrange things aren't looking at some of the more popular compendium teams i would hope yeah you'd think so uh but we'll see hope so hope you're right um because yeah like it's it's tough that there's now people who are you know invested in a faction in other systems that just kind of have nothing here for them though i do run uh my inquisitorial kill team in my custodies 2000 point list so there's something for everyone (laughs) yeah um also this is just a conspiracy theory that i'm 100 making up uh but i'm assuming the switch of vet guard now becoming death core is because when they do ride off into the sunset they're gonna be like bam here's katachans they're almost the same thing but it's just like all the balance changes that everyone has been wanting for the last like five years we're finally gonna get in like the new version of the same thing and we're gonna call it like katachans or whatever and we're gonna have new models because those models are super overdue and they're gonna be mega popular um but then like you could still just like run those rules using your death core or whatever else you were doing like your katie and vet guard and just like when they ride off you'll have a new rule set and i'm i'm sure that's going to happen like when angels of death fade out they're going to be like you know what all the changes that we've wanted for space marines is back um you can you know bring whatever new crazy things like those dudes with the crazy nerf rocket looking things bring those guys into kill team (laughs) like the plasma dudes um give me some assault intercessors i don't know yeah yeah the brand new Brand new strike force that's just all of the specialist primaris intercessors all at once. Anything you need to buy a box of twenty of to get one. <laughs> that would certainly get the sales up. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely one of the things that I'm like maybe the most appreciative of. Like now that compendium is kind of in the rear view mirror. It's like if someone wants to play the game, you're not going to point them to like, oh, let's buy this three box team. Like for as cool as Warp Coven is. 
so expensive yeah. to buy the team or like Wormblade, yeah. where these teams are basically money walls in front of people like oh i really want to play this go buy this thing that's kind of impossible to get it does suck i still you remember know? the day that i went and bought my Wormblade team and i left the game store as a single tear ran down <laughs> my cheek yeah, and I saw the I saw the number on the receipt. It was sad. I bought, Did you actually buy all four of the agents? I bought um, well, I bought three, and I just magnetized the oh, yeah, Sanctus. Yeah, yeah. I Which bought the, uh, because now the other Sanctus is actually playable. Yeah, I got everything for the Void Dancer troop the day that we started our Patreon. <laughs> so it was like, all right, all right, I, we can invest in this now. <laughs> it's like, I could go spend 110 Canadian dollars on all this stuff, you know? <laughs> yeah. Because honestly, for as accessible as Compendium is and as easy as it was to like learn those rules, if you brought a new person in, you're pointing them to, well, you could get one box of Tyranid gene sealers, but really... Right. You were also buying a box of Warriors and then a box of Hormigons, and now you're three boxes deep in what was supposed to be a one-box game. Or, totally. God forbid, someone wanted to play Warp Coven, and you're like, please buy these six aspiring sorcerers you're two yeah. boxes deep already. You buy the Zangors, and then the Rubrics, and you're like, oh man, I'm like $300 deep into this team. And it was just like kind of an insane proposition, because if you want to be competitive on some of these White Dwarf teams, you really do need to access a lot of boxes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. We're just go crazy. You I'm guys have the new warp coven is just all zangers. That's my dream. I mean, yeah, you could. You could definitely do that, right? You've got the enlightened dudes on the discs that you could make into champions for your sorcerers. <laughs> You've got your Oh man. <laughs> but it's like, you know how um in the Inquisition team you are the Inquisitor, right? There's no Inquisitor model. It's like Correct. now you are the sorcerer and you just control your zangers. Zangers. Fun. Yeah, that would be awesome. Honestly, I don't want that. For the record, I don't. I don't actually want that. Honestly, <laughs> I'm all about my completely ridiculous skews. You kind of, it's, it's. You I, set me on I have something. seen some. I've seen some people float the all Zangor list right now in the current edition, basically as the only way that you play against Pathfinders, because as it currently stands, that matchup it feels effectively impossible. So, is there like any competitive build? That involves only one sorcerer. Like, do you ever not take three sorcerers? The only argument I've seen for it is when you're playing against something like Pathfinders or Veteran Guard. Basically, somewhere where you don't need the sorcerers and you just need to blend them as fast as possible because you are getting targeted down by a million pieces of AP2 or AP1 weaponry. Then you take right. one sorcerer, slow them down, spam 10 Zangors, blow the horn, and just pray. Just pray really hard that you make it into your opponent's lines fast enough. Specifically, I think, on In the Dark, where now you start like in the midboard and you just end up in your opponent's zone. And you're like, you just pray that it's good enough. We're like talking to real kill team players and you're getting like tech advice. You're going to destroy me next time. I can't deal with this actual strategy. Yeah, I, want see, I want to see this on the YouTube channel. That, cause that would be a fun video, I think. You know, you just blow the horn yeah. and you just hit the prey step and the Zangor is just running. Yeah. They all, they're all engaged while you're at it. Yeah. Because I think, I think the problem or the reason why it might theoretically work is you have a two inch delta between what your opponent can charge with and what you can charge with. So you blow the horn instability your opponent you just everyone is moved at the at the nine inch bubble you're just like all right well you can't charge me and you can't see me so i'm just gonna charge you one by one and pray oh that's actually uh whoa yeah just a hilarious meme as far as like the classification of those teams goes do you have a team that you're most interested in kind of seeing where they go over this next edition you know we've seen a little bit of all these teams getting previewed we haven't seen all the rest of the novitiates we haven't seen all the rest of death core but it does seem like you know there's some sizable changes as they currently stand is there a team that you're like the most excited to see for me it's uh, warp coven for sure mm -hmm. um i'm also pretty interested in what they do with um the hearthkin salvagers because they're they're definitely my favorite team. And I actually like love where they're at right now. So that's a team like Warp Coven, that's a team that I'm hoping they almost like redo completely. Whereas the Salvagers, I'm thinking how 
how can they change them as little as possible? That's what I'm hoping. Yeah, and I know Victor can... hates playing against them. I but... do, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the Salvagers are like a brutal shooting team as it currently stands in this edition. Because if you set up the barricades, you really can't touch them until they're ready to get touched. It's just, it's yeah. like, it's too many guys with three up saves. It's like just impossible to chew through. And like, you know, I'm not trying to just play seize ground and make you come to me it's like i want to kill stuff and it's like come on let me kill you fight me irl that's what they say yeah exactly <laughs> no as long as they don't take my shoot for free ploy i'm happy best play <laughs> in the game yeah it definitely is a the big ancestors part of their identity. tell you to fire the railgun yeah oh man they're a fun team I'm excited uh, to see yeah. uh, how Pathfinders look just because, you yeah. know, it's like they've gone from being such a boogeyman to being like completely useless for a season and then being back to like the biggest boogeyman for the third season. Just I'm, I'm curious to see where it ends up and, uh, you know, how the team looks, because it wouldn't surprise me if it's uh, just I could see it being totally different. Right. I can see them really. Just yeah. doing a big rewrite on it. I mean, Pathfinder uh, marker lights were like. I mean, it felt like there was such a baked in strategy with the team, and you had a pretty good idea. It was like one of those teams where you had a pretty good idea of how your opponent was going to play them, and it's like, all right, well, am I going to be able to play the game before I die, or am I just going to die and then you'll play the game alone for three turns? And so, um, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm interested to see like. Of the two of us, I have the Pathfinders, and so I guess I'm technically the Pathfinder player here, but I mean, I think I've, I've got like three games with them. You should uh, admit that online, dude. <laughs> you can't say that. People this is, look, this is a Pathfinder you. safe space on the internet because I'm the <laughs> Pathfinder player. <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, Pathfinders is, like, such an old team. Like, those rules have been out forever. So I'm sure, uh, mm. like, they've, the rules writing team has learned so much about, like, the game and, like, right. what makes it awesome. I'm I'm really hoping that they can capture, like, Pathfinders being as awesome as they are. Like, having a pretty significant rewrite, but, like, still being really good and being really cool and capturing the essence. Like, I think they're a fun and cool team. I've got, you know, I've got a box of Pathfinders that I've built, like, two of them. But, you know... <laughs> I think they're cool. It'll be disappointing if those models don't have a use, just because I really like the sculpts, like the bionic yeah. arm of the Pathfinder girl, and like the only one of the only dudes on the Xenos that actually throws a grenade. Be bummed yeah. if some of those bits don't get a use. Yeah, well, I mean, I think uh, you know, I'm sure they will. I it that would really be a drag if they like if you have to change the loadout you know if like we've we've all had a loadout for conceivably like what three years at this point to have to like start digging around for bits and snipping arms off would be a drag but i guess i guess we'll know tomorrow is yeah, tomorrow we'll xenos day or is tomorrow yeah, chaos day? I, oh no tomorrow's chaos day so at the time okay. of recording this is the tuesday yeah. of uh you know september 10th so we're gonna get the chaos rules and then I suppose the Xenos rules, and then maybe they're just saving the, the Space the Marines space all for probably one for pile. Friday. Uh, I yeah. wonder if that's going to be Chaos and Loyal, all the Space Marines in one. Probably. I'm definitely very yeah, excited that could be a that fun day. Way. And it's also yeah, the week of finally... Space Marine 2 release, which is not to be right. understated, I think, in the zeitgeist of Warhammer. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, it's like they already sold yeah. 2 million copies, and it came out yesterday. No kidding. I bought it yesterday, and then my like computer almost blew up, and I had to refund it on Steam. I couldn't run it. <laughs> I got it on PS5. Logged a couple hours. Nice. Brother. Brother! <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely like a fun reaction. vibe. <laughs> yeah. 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 I painted two Space Marines recently. Does that count? Basically, space yeah. Marines. You're, I did yeah, have one like of my there. one of the guys yeah. up in Westchester come into a Discord and he's like, I have a burning desire to play Ultramarines all of a sudden. I was like, it's working. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to go buy a combat uh, patrol hybrid. right now. <laughs> <laughs> also, um, pretty much like even the Phobos Marines in that game, like if you approach cover in that game at all, you just like if you tap it, it just explodes. Um, that's pretty much how you're supposed to play Space Marines and Kill Team 
That includes Phobos <laughs> Marines. Just, you can't crouch, you can't hide, you touch cover and it explodes, and then you just punch everybody's head off and just keep shooting. It was, it was funny. So yesterday I was playing, like I got halfway through the first level before my computer totally had a meltdown. And so, but I, you know, I had slain about a hundred Hormigons, <laughs> or Termagons, whatever the ones with claws and not guns yeah, are. Yeah, Hormigons. Yeah, Harbor Gods. And I was thinking, like, it's so funny thinking about, like, at one point in this edition, playing Space Marines versus Tyranids, because I, one Space Marine, have killed about 17 kill teams worth of Tyranids <laughs> with a chainsword so far in this game. So if in the lore, if this is how this is supposed to go, then that was never going to work. <laughs> Yeah, each well, actually, in Kill Team, what you didn't realize is each Hormigant represented a squad of Hormigants. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Oh man, it's definitely an interesting way to get to engage with the lore. I mean, between Dark Tide, this, and all the total war games that have come out in recent history, and Demon Hunters, I guess, in Warhammer 40k specifically, there's been a lot of kind of like smaller scale games but the lore and the game never really mesh that well because when you play 40k proper doesn't really read like a book at all mm -hmm. but in kill team it kind of does sometimes like sure our space marines aren't going to just kill an infinite number of hormigons and get up because the brother battle brothers picked them up but you do kind of get the sense of a space marine being a badass at least in the games where you're not hiding against the meltas and the plasmas of the vet guard yeah <laughs> and even totally. when your opponent brings the plasmas and the meltas uh just face them in open combat and they're gonna whiff sometimes and you're gonna shoot a lot more than them yeah yeah and it pans out, I promise. We're feeling pretty good about the new edition and all the previews and all this other stuff that they've been talking about, which is great because I'm very excited, especially with all the other reworks coming down the line. As far as the teams that are staying classified for a little bit longer, do you guys have other teams that you're excited for? I know we mentioned the Hearthkin and the Dwarves kind of broadly, but you know, personally, I'm really excited to see if Blades of Cain get some other changes. It looked like from the preview, probably not, just because the team was probably designed with this edition in mind somewhat. But I am kind of curious to see what the rest of their data sheets look like. Because maybe Striking Scorpions will have a three up save, and then there it could be kind of cool to see Blades of Cain mucking around without their four up saves. No kidding. Well, I think they did show They showed I the leader, sh and the leaders have all had three up saves. Oh, yeah, that's right. The whole time. That's right. So I'm really I, curious if Striking Scorpions got upgraded to a 3-up. Honestly, the whole I, team could have 3-ups and I wouldn't be mad. Yeah. Me neither, because I play them. Um, I'd go 2-ups <laughs> even. <laughs> as, the, as the current purveyor of elf bullshit on this podcast. Yeah, you know exactly. What? You know what? I'll say 2-ups on the Exarch and 3-up on everybody else. Sign me up. Put me on the paper. Sounds fair. I'm in. Sounds like a totally fair kill team. I I can't wait to run. mad because I like shrecked you one time and then you never played them again. <laughs> yeah, it was like so <laughs> annoying. The friggin' Hyrotech Circle is another team that I can't stand <laughs> playing against. <laughs> you know, ruining my elf dreams. But I do think that like the based on what we've seen so far, I am most excited to try a uh, all scorpions and banshees team with the seven inch move. I can just. It's going to be great. It's going to be so nice just like flying up there and uh, ruining everyone's day. And like being able to flip on, on turn one, like everyone to play on Conceal yeah. and then just like flip on turn one. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm definitely going to have my fun with Space Marines for a while, but I've done several games with just pure Banshees. And with those <laughs> rules, if they're not like super duper changed, I'm like, I would 100% try a couple games with that again because I've got the models. Yeah. It just seems really cool and thematic and just like howling Banshees are insanity and I love it. Likewise. You know, as far as the rules changes go, are you guys excited to have some of these rules changes for the YouTube channel? You know, just now you guys don't have to worry about turn one nearly as much. What a relief. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think yeah. Brad has said this a few times, but like, I haven't seen a single rules change that I haven't liked so far for the new edition. Like, everything everything really feels great uh universal equipment is going to be so nice like not only in terms of like the youtube videos and just like having having less 
like specifically to worry about one guy and being able to you know just like kind of have a macro view of it a bit more but like just in my games <laughs> like what a great yeah. change you know it's, i mean because uh, like right now as far as like actually playing a game you know for me in a tournament setting and also just like to teach people it's like well let me just put these rubber bands on your dudes and like, uh, like a single that. dude with like three rubber bands it's like kind of breaks the immersion but as far as me not having to drag around three extra tokens to represent that this space marine's got all the fixings you know those yeah. things going away is kind of nice especially now that it seems like a lot of stuff is moving to like maybe a turning point restriction or something could just be nice to you know smooth out the gameplay a lot absolutely yeah less bookkeeping is always nice for me i'm someone that when i go and play with in a room that has more than just me and my opponent when there's like multiple games happening in the same room my brain instantly stops being able to process any useful information so like the less bookkeeping i have to worry about the happier i am you know like always whenever i would roll up to a game in person because it's very different when we film our battle reports i've made like a very anal retentive spreadsheet and we have to like keep track of everything as it happens and we have all the equipment so i like pick my equipment ahead of time and i don't have to think about it because i can just look at the spreadsheet if i forget what i pick but when i'm actually playing a game in real life i'll just like pick the easiest to remember loadout even if it's very suboptimal just because i know like oh there's like five people talking at the same time in this room there's no way i'm remembering that this guy in particular is the one with the extra like plus one to his armor save no i'm not going to remember that so i'll just put like you know everyone gets plus one hp or whatever the easiest option is every time yeah, I'll because i just can't like maybe if i went to a tournament for once i would actually like write it down and try and you know know what i'm doing but when i'm just playing with people i i can't focus like that <laughs> so <laughs> honestly make me happy. the perfect build for you to play a tournament is just intercession with the doom guy because all your equipment's on one guy it's the easiest team ever and then you just run around and slap people does sound extremely satisfying as well it is i need a one operative kill team yeah, that'd be great. the emperor can, is the emperor of a kill team, <laughs> and he just automatically just slays everybody. Yeah, it's hopeless, or he's just a chair, he can't do anything. <laughs> I'll take it. Honestly, speaking of easy team wide equipment, I am gonna miss the breachers just giving everyone one extra AP or uh, HP. Sorry, HP. but the uh, one change for the breachers is so nice that they can charge through hatchways now as one of their ploys. I love that they finally have like a Gallo Dark specific thing, you know, because it always felt like they were the team that came with the terrain the first time, but like they, the hatch cutter couldn't cut hatches for some <laughs> reason on the, the house he came with. You know, I'm so glad that they got something Gallo Dark specific and it sounds uh, sounds pretty good. I really wish that they had shown a normal operative so I could tell if they were just going to bake the one HP into all the operatives the way that everybody just played Breachers yeah. to begin with. Because generally you were just playing them at eight wounds and yeah, nine totally. wounds on the gunners, which was so annoying. So I am really curious if they just did it, but they only showed us the Endurant when the Endurant still looks mostly the same. Yeah. With just a little bit of extra crit damage. But yeah, having the new deck hand. I assume tactical ploy from the coloring of the ploy. So now that you can do a rule break that definitely wasn't there before, because for anyone who doesn't know on the current in the dark, if you are doing operate hatchway, you can only do it on basically a normal move or a dash, not on a charge or a fallback. So if you're like hurrying through an area, you can't open a door. But now if you're playing Imperial Navy breachers, you can do a little bit of a rule break, which is pretty powerful. Yeah. Yeah. I can't wait to get that one on the table as well. What other rules change that really hyped me up? So I've been on the record uh, for, for many months as a big-time hater of the Exaction Squad, and I know that upsets a lot of people. Um, even at Nova, somebody came up to me and was like, hey, I like Exaction Squad. Do you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> like, got on my case yeah. for being an Exaction hater. But like, they just felt so unsatisfying for me to play, I think. And like one of the many reasons was like the arresting was like, oh, so hyped up when they got shut off. Like, oh, they're going to arrest people. But then 
you know, in like 80% of your games, you couldn't even arrest anybody, but they previewed, um, the, the, the operative they previewed for Action Squad was the Castigator, and looking at Castigator's arrest, so I know this is not the run-of-the-mill arrest, this is like an um, improved arrest, but still, it used to be he could only arrest people, uh, I think, with, with 10 health or less or something, now it's just anybody, and I think before you had to pay an action, and now it's before just like it a was built the arrest in action. Yeah, yeah, it was like so annoying. Like you barely used, at least I barely used it. Uh, in some matchups, like he was the only guy that could do anything. In some matchups, nobody could ever arrest anybody. But now it seems like it's just built in, and it'll work against anybody. And I'm really interested to see how arresting works for the rest of the operatives. Um, yeah, it's you know, like a I, sweaty. I actually, as like a sweaty tournament player, there was exactly like one area where the arresting was kind of cute. And it was when Chaos Cult were at like the peak of their power. Cause you could run up to a dude that turned into a mutant, arrest him, and then if he and then you could run away effectively. And if he mutated into a torment, he would still be arrested, which was hilarious. Yeah. Like I actually find their their fluff and their theme kind of fun and funny. Just like you know, all this crazy stuff running around, you know, you're fighting, like, giant mutants, you're fighting, like, psychic demons, you're fighting all this stuff, and you're just cops arresting people, like, that's kind of funny, but, uh, it just felt like all of their cool flavor never really hit for me, and I, I hope that what we've seen so far with them kind of is extended to the rest of the team, and it makes it actually like viable for you to use their cool stuff. That would be nice. Yeah. I don't fundamentally disagree because right now the identity for exaction squad is basically the pachinko parlor. You put on a bunch of shields, you turn on the phosphor lumen and you're like, well, I don't know what's going to happen in literally any of the combat steps because <laughs> you know, I went to LVO and Ryan Slater from turning point tactics. He was playing exaction squad at the time. And he's like, you know, I have no idea what happens when a Felgor meets a shield because we've done it a bunch of times i could die he could die nothing could happen it's impossible to know <laughs> yeah it's funny i built the meme like ma as many shield guys as you can build build when i first got the box and like i'm pretty sure i have one of the worst exaction rosters of all time uh, i don't have the sniper uh like half the specialists I didn't build because I was just trying to build as many shield guys as possible. Because I think I read some article that Ace said the shield guys are the best guys. So I'm like, okay, I'll just build as many shield guys as I can. <laughs> Turned out it's not good. Those um, guys at Goonhammer don't know what they're talking about, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ace, but, Ace had no idea what he was talking about when he said shields were good. <laughs> Unfortunately, you can take 10, saying, you can only take five. <laughs> I'm not saying they're bad. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say they're bad, but. Um, I definitely have just a trying bad to say Ace is bad. Well, I'm excited to <laughs> I'm excited to get a second box of these guys. Um, once they're reboxed, I think they said they're being reboxed with like new stuff or something. I don't know, but uh, I mean, they're gonna have to change some of these because you can't sell Veteran Guard now that they're the Death Core. <laughs> yeah, so I'm excited at the prospect of maybe this actually being a team that I don't hate. That sounds very fun to me. Playing teams that I like sounds better than playing teams I don't like. So, yeah, I know you yeah. guys just recently put out a, a fun tier list, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that was exactly. full of hot takes. <laughs> Who yeah, won? What was, I don't even remember. What was the most fun team? Uh, I think we said it was Corsairs, right? Probably. That sounds like Corsairs. something I would say. I still do feel that way. Corsairs do definitely seem pretty fun. They're just, you like living on the nice edge of, you know, you roll your dice and you're, you're praying that you just don't hit your ones and twos at the wrong time. It's funny, yeah, because so talking to like, you know, some some serious kill team people at Nova and it's like hearing their, like talking to Adrian about Corsairs, right? And it's like, he's talking about how you know, uh, I just I couldn't make them work competitively because, you know, you just like you can't trust the dice. And it's like, oh, man, I go into every game assuming that everything I do is going to be a six. It's like, it never even occurred to me not to trust the dice. <laughs> <laughs>
That's really the difference between the YouTube content creator and the com- yeah. competition sweaty brain pressure. Like, how do I best mitigate the times that I roll ones and twos? Because when I was playing Pathfinders early on, I was like, I'm going to roll as many dice as humanly possible in this attack sequence because I really can't expect anything well- to go well in this situation. Right. Well, there's so many times when we've been like, okay, I have a 90% chance to win the game if I take the safe play, but I can win in glorious fashion. Like, I can... I can table you and win like 20 to 8 if I get this 10% chance to do this crazy thing. I always go for the crazy thing. <laughs> and maybe nine, 9 out of 10 videos you get like destroyed and everyone <laughs> in the comments just says you're an idiot. But the one time it pays off, e- eternal glory. Eternal glory. Yeah. And then the thing is, when you take the risky play and it pays off, all people see is your skill because they're <laughs> yeah. not YouTube commenters are not thinking about, Oh, that was a bad play. They're results oriented. You know, <laughs> if you play really well, but you get bad dice, you're terrible. And if you play terribly, but you get really lucky, Oh man, Victor, what were you doing? God you know? tier. Yeah. <laughs> YouTube commenters only see the results. They don't, they don't see anything else. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, for for me as a competitive person, I'm looking for the times when it's like, well, I'm out of options and I need to take the risky thing because I'm trying to mitigate as many of those situations as possible. But sometimes your back's against the wall. And, you know, at the first world championships, I was like, well, I basically lose unless this single pathfinder charges onto this point and stabs a dude so I can take this take the last point with an APL and I needed a six to get the crit because I did not have enough life to get the kill. Otherwise there was a blooded operative at three wounds and I ran in there and I just poked his eyes out (laughs) (laughs) on a reroll. It was like, I rolled my dice. I was like, well, didn't get it there. I was like, well, I need, I do need this. I have one CP. This is literally the last play of the game. I rerolled it into a six and my phone was like, I hate you. And I was like, (laughs) (laughs) and you're still riding that high. Yeah, no, exactly. I live rent free in his brain sometimes. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna say, uh, Brad, for your you, what's your favorite? Like, you did a crazy play and it panned out moment. If there's like the top thing that comes to your head. Okay, this is not necessarily a crazy play, but this is like when I defied all odds and like my bad play got completely unpunished. All right, best moment, and I'm sorry to bring this up, Victor, because I'm yeah. sure it's a lot of bad memories. This was a recent game. This was uh, Hearth and Salvagers versus Corsairs. It was our it was our two most fun teams. It was our two favorite teams that we played to like, you know, it was one of our last games of the edition and we wanted to, you know, end on a high. So playing this game, I had my my Grenadier, right? And the Grenadier's got this pretty nasty bomb. And Victor has grouped up, I think he had four like three or four guys pretty close together. And so at the end of turning point one, I had kind of positioned where I could like maybe move dash and then pay to free shoot and maybe get a crazy kill. And I win initiative and I'm like setting up all my stuff. Like I'm going to do this. So I'm like, okay, I'm so excited. This is going to be a crazy play. So I move, I dash. And as soon as I end my dash, Victor does the play where he moves. Who's the guy with the two oh, swords? The deadly ambush. Yeah. The deadly yeah, ambush the with the Carnathi. I'm like the best, the best fighter on the team. And I'm like, oh no! I completely like threw away my my first activation when I want initiative. I threw away my grenadier. This is terrible. What am I gonna do? Oh, but he was also buffed. He was buffed from the comms from last turn, so he he already had three APL. So I'm like, well, I have one APL left. I can't shoot because. I've been charged, but I have a plasma knife. So why don't I just see what happens? And I got like three sixes and I just shanked you. (laughs) So that was one kill. And then I was like, okay, well I'll pay to throw this thing for free. And I threw the grenade at two more guys. This one guy got a triple kill against all odds. And then later that turn, he got shot and died. But I paid to tap the objective he was on for free (laughs) as he died. So this one guy, out of my misplay, forgetting that Deadly Ambush was a thing, I still got a triple kill and stole your point. Completely It was so frustrating. It was so frustrating because I, like, I obviously, like, I saw your Grenadier there, and I knew that he was buffed, 
And it's like, yeah, okay, I can put these four guys here because I know, like, certainly you won't charge in here with that grenade because I have <laughs> my, I have my guy with two swords and deadly ambush ready to go. It's like, and that was my like. I didn't even think I was going to have to do it because it was like, surely this is enough of a deterrent that Brad's not going to do it. It's like, sure enough. And then, I, and then my thinking when you did do it, it was like, okay, I'll charge. Like, I'm sure Brad won't fight. And surely if he does, I'll at least like just parry everything out and tie him up. It's like, <laughs> no, he just like sliced him in half and killed my fell arc and soul weaver. Uh, GG. <laughs> oh man. That's actually I great. Was curious. I was curious after that. Sometimes, like, when we're filming stuff, it's funny because, like, we sit with the game in our minds for at least a week while we're, like, editing it and doing all this stuff. And so I was curious. I, I thought, what is actually the chance of me getting that kill there? So I plugged it in to our friendly neighborhood kill team calculator. And I think it was around, like, 30%, just or, like, just under 30% that I was able to kill you, which is a lot higher than I expected. Yeah. But... I think the real thing is when it comes down to combat math, if you can two shot someone and you get to start a fight, it's almost always like it's always in range that you could win the fight. Yeah. Although this is a perfect example of this is like the perfect example of you can't depend on the dice because you've got I've I go first. I get to I get to reroll all my dice. But, you know, four attacks on threes. Sometimes you just don't get enough hits or your opponent goes first and stabs you with a couple extra crits. Because at the end of the day, if the power sword doesn't roll any crits, those lethal five plasma knife shanks are are going to chop you in half. Yeah, they sure will. (laughs) And I guess that's really what you're the most worried about, Brad, right? As for the transition from this current edition of Kill Team to the next edition of Kill Team, if you're going to have to rearrange how many of your dudes get plasma knives. That is tragedy. I'm worried that, like, what are they going to do? They can't, yeah. make a, they can't make a universal equipment of, like, everybody gets a plasma knife. They're going to have to do something. They're going to have to nerf plasma knives, or they're going to have to... Because that was that know. was the big change that kind of pushed them into viability from when they were first released and then going to where they ended up is they got their plasma knives pushed in and now everybody had a pretty good profile and could mix it up in melee. So you could actually do a little bit of everything on your three up save. Totally. Like I almost always ran them with almost everybody have having a plasma knife. So yeah, yeah. That's and then with the release of Hernkin, it does it did kind of become like the dwarf identity is like everyone's got a knife. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I loved it. I thought it was um, kind of thematic. I mean, it would have been better if it was like a plasma axe or something, I guess. But I mean, they're future dwarves. I guess knives are are cool, more practical, easier to carry around. It's probably not even true. I mean, the vibe for the vibe for the dwarves is kind of inspired by like the NASA punk movement visually. So I remember when Starfield came out, I was like, "Oh, I've seen this! I've seen this entire aesthetic as like the dwarf aesthetic in Warhammer 40k." Yeah, I'm wondering how many dwarf teams can I expect in the new edition? I'm hoping at least three. I mean, as far as ranges, zero, but as far as ranges that need to get you know love taps throughout this edition if vespids and tempestuous scions are anything to be looking forward to what are you guys the most excited for as far as maybe you know ranges that need updates custodies are pretty high on the list for me um would love would love a talons team i'm hoping my my dream here's my unfounded conspiracy theory um yeah so on the the kill op chart that we've seen we've all seen uh, one of the unit or operative numbers is five, and we all know that there are no five operative teams. I think that the five operative team is going to be the first five uh, official female sculpted cus- custodies. Oh, you think we're going to get five female custodies in one? Box? I want it so bad. It's going to be a true disaster zone for Bell. <laughs> not, <laughs> not from the female custodies part, but just on the raw numbers of two up safe. Well, yeah, they'd have. I mean, I don't think it could be two up saves, but I, yeah. you know, um, I would love to see that. But yeah, like, I mean, just anything, you know, Tyranids are an interesting thing, right? Because I like, there's so many people calling for a Tyranid kill team, of course, because Tyranids are sweet and uh, they don't have one, especially now they really don't have one. But yeah. like, I guess, 
like Tyranids don't really have like specialists in the same way, right? It's like uh, in you, you they never get, they get like gene sealers, they get like the lictors, yeah. and now there's like the von Ryan. So it might I'm kind of hoping that there's a synapse mechanic for whatever ends up being right. the Tyranids. So it's like instead of it being a specialist, maybe it's like each of the couple like forward organisms gets their own little synapse bubble for the dork so maybe you have more mooks but kind of like the blades of cane where you have aspect techniques maybe it's like each of these organisms has a way that it influences it's like subgroupings that could be cool and that would be a way that yeah have like specialists yeah it could do like a geller pox type thing right like uh you know four big smart things and a hundred little yeah, dumb I mean, things. That's what I was gonna say. I was like, give me, uh, give me like a combination five models. That's all uh, warriors and lictors, and then you've got like equipment options that are like ripper swarms and like that'd be cool. You know, uh, the spore mines. Yeah. Also, Admech. I think like Admech is in a pretty interesting spot. I yeah. have, I've fallen in and out of love with Hunter Clade so many times over the last few years. Like they were the first bespoke team i started playing and uh i really love them and then they were terrible and they got that big buff and then i think they were a bit overtuned but the list building always really turned me off like it was just it was too complicated um like not that i couldn't figure out but it always just felt like you know I can't be bothered. Like, you know, if you have more of, if you have three gunners, then you can have this many Sicarians. And if you have more than four, but less than five Sicarians, then you're allowed to have two gunners, but only if one of them is left-handed. It's like, all of it was just like, okay, please, please simplify this because I love the models. I love the range, but uh, it always felt like a lot of bookkeeping and like, you know, Rangers and Vanguards, (laughs) <laughs> you know like, it also, there was like too much minutia on the team or something um but i'm really looking forward to like i, I imagine there will be an admic a proper bespoke admic team at some point because it feels like the white dwarves almost feel like a bit of a forgotten child so far in the like rollout of news you know all of, we're getting this like you know they're not part of the imperium yeah. Uh, Imperium article. They're not part of the Eldar article. Like you yeah. know, if you were curious yeah, about the Void Dancers, it's like at the end of the Eldar yeah. article. There's a little, there's a little notes like Void Dancers will appear online at a later date. I was like, oh come on, guys! Everybody yeah. wants to know. Did you give them fly or did you give them flip belt? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So I don't know. I think that's uh, that's one range I'm really looking forward to because I think the like the design language of that army is so cool, and the specialists can be anything, right? Like they can just. They can really go wild with that, and I think it'd be I'd love uh, to see interesting. Some tech priests, yeah. I feel like the tech priest sculpts could use a revamp, and I think there's a lot of interesting stuff they could do with tech priests and kill team. You know, some yeah. I mean, we did have that new the stuff. new gun servitor in the imperial agents list, right? Yep. So we've seen some of the new sculpts that does look pretty good. Totally. Yeah, I already kind of mentioned Catachans. Uh, I'm expecting a refresh before. Hopefully within the next three years. You gotta think so. I'm I'm kinda I'm really praying for new Grey Knight sculpts, you know. I'll be realistic here. Yeah. Grey Knights were one of those first few armies for me when I was a kid. You know, it was oh, yeah. like some adult or someone who was a couple years older than me who had like earned a little bit of money handed off some Grey Knights. I was like, these are the coolest things I've ever seen. They've got storm vultures. You know, when you're a kid, you're like, whoa, instead of one <laughs> rocket, you fire two rockets at the same time. And you're a psyker. And you have a power sword. It was like, it's too much for a small, for my small child brain at the time. So was, I would love to get bigger gray knights. Yeah. That was crude for me. And so uh far stalker was like a real, you know, awakening a core memory <laughs> when that came out. Yeah. I was, be nice I was if that team was fun. Yeah. I'm, I'm really, really hoping that they kind of lean into a little bit of the body horror for the fruit where they eat people this time around. Like, <laughs> you know, of the of the things that I thought was a big miss when Kinban came out, Kinban are a fine team, but they're very much like the special ops mercenaries that die very quickly. <laughs> well, yeah, unfortunately, yeah, they sure do. But the original release for Crute let them eat people to gain APL, which didn't work at the time. Like it was just a fully non-functional mechanic because you would get the APL in the middle of your activation, it would not give you anything, and then it would go away. Right. 
but I would really love if they showed a little bit of that. Or, you know, if meat were just floating, that would be that would be a nice change. Floating meat. You know what I'd love to see? You know that one Votan HQ that's like a wizard? Mm. Like the little dwarven yeah. psyker with like the two like raven robots that fly around. I'd love a kill team of that kind of stuff. Like wizard dwarves. That would be my favorite kill team, and I'd never play anything else. Go yeah. play Warcry. You want wizard <laughs> dwarves. <laughs> but yeah, my, what's better my than prayer. wizard dwarves is sci-fi wizard dwarves. Yeah, true. Yeah. With floating plasma knives. <laughs> and floating meat. Yeah, and floating meat. <laughs> uh, Orc so, Storm Boys. Just want to throw that one out there. Those guys are cool, and they could use some fresh models. And like, if we only have one orc kill kill team, so having a second option would be cool. If they were storm boys, we already have the precedent for flying. Yeah, we only have one orc kill team that still has a massive representation in the meta. So maybe dilute that a bit. Be nice. We know the orcs are going to be popular. They'd sell well. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It would be nice too to have an orc team that actually feels more like brutish. Because the commandos, commandos are cool, and obviously people like them, but they kind of feel like almost so fringe in the overall like flavor of orcs. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, the they're, cunning, they're almost a bit cunning and brutal. Cunning. Yeah, yeah, all cunning, no brutality. You know, yeah. Adrian on his big run was just like running away, keeping at the edges, and then when someone decided to start a fight, they would just to scratch it and then headbutt them back, and then go on to delete <laughs> your opponent. Yeah. You guys, you know, for your for your part on Mountainside Tabletop on the YouTube channel, you guys have your YouTube channel. It's obviously done very well, which is part of the reason why we were super stoked to have you guys on. But you guys have like a local community that you guys call your own outside of your digital footprint. Yeah, a little bit. Um like there's certainly a, like a competitive community that I dipped my toe in and out of pretty quickly. Um, But through that, uh, met like another, just a few people in a great play group that's, uh, you know, turned into a pretty consistent thing. So, uh, you know, there's like, it's actually, it's been growing a bit, but like, you know, kind of seven or eight people uh, that we, we play with pretty consistently, but there is like definitely a larger... Uh, a larger community blood bowl is really big around here for some reason. Um, and so like, I think ev- like blood bowl night is always packed uh, and I'm not into that you, yet. But, uh, you guys know if you play 11s or sevens as far as blood bowl pitches. Oh, it's 11s because they take up all the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, there's, there's definitely, definitely a local community. And I mean, like we were talking about earlier, the Toronto community is really strong, uh, both strong in terms of community and also just in terms of like competitive strength. There's, uh, you know, yeah, the, I think the real... Maple Leaf Wargaming crew is out and around yeah. your guys's area. They've got at least two, if not three players, I think, going to the world championships this year. Yeah. Yeah, we were yeah, almost going to go to one of their um, tournaments. We were signed up and everything. And then the night before. Um, unfortunately something came up and I had to cancel. And then shortly after I had a kid and it's just been, um, yeah, it's funny. Cause like between, between having a young kid and also like my actual job, I work almost exclusively on like nights and weekends. So all the times that tournaments happen, I'm working or I'm looking after my kid. So it's, um, hard to get out, but hopefully with a new edition coming out, um, I'd like to get out to some stuff. That'd be fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and we're looking forward to any of the YouTube content that you guys are going to be shooting for the new edition because it does feel way more player friendly, I think, from the previews that we've seen so far. Like some of the most annoying mechanics I know you guys mentioned when you guys finally felt obscurity correctly. You're like, oh, I know yeah. that this is coming up. That was like a big level up. Now, obscurity is not going to be nearly as annoying to play around. Totally. Totally. I think it's, it's, uh, it, everything we've seen so far has shown that, um, like accessibility has been a big driving factor in, 
all of the changes between second and third edition or 21 and 24, whatever. Um, and I think personally, I really love that, but as a content creator, I especially really love that because I think it's just like, it's going to make our videos easier for people that aren't like, you know, in the weeds, kill team people to like follow along and understand. And, you know, maybe, be able to kind of tell a story of a battle a little bit better. Yeah, and the new terrain looks really fun to film on. It does. There's yeah. so many good shots of, you know, the guy sniping out through the window, going through totally. uh, little archways, you know. I think it'll be yeah. great. I'm really liking the kind of multi-layered part of that board because one of the reasons why i like beta decima just from a visual standpoint is having three layers of gameplay just lets the boards look really nice even if the games are just kind of okay on them yeah so volka seems to have a little bit of that multi-dimensionality which i'm i'm, I'm liking because octarius ultimately as a tournament player i'm very bored of octarius because it's just i'm just used to it so it'll be nice to get something totally. different i mean the thing with octarius is that like and the reason that it's still like every tournament is full of it is like the game as it is currently written just functions so well on that terrain, right? Like clearly the rules and the terrain came out at the same time and none of the other terrain sets from season one felt as good, right? Like everything broke it a little bit, you know? Uh, but yeah. I guess that's why Octarius has been so popular, but from a filming perspective has always been a bit of a nightmare because it's so overtly orky. And so like, if there aren't orcs on camera, the terrain looks totally weird. Um, and so it's nice to have a bit more of a neutral background now. Uh, yes. The Imperial world of Novastera with inquisition agents and novitiates battling over the objectives. Ah, uh, yes. Orc terrain, of course. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It'll be nice for us to have the backdrop of the big gun. And oh, honestly, I'm gun. looking forward to when you guys are you guys planning to film anything around the non-player operative stuff that they've been previewing? Yeah, we've got to figure that out, like have to kind of look at it more to get a better understanding. But it definitely uh, it looks awesome. Uh, feel like it'll be a great, certainly a great thing for streams. Um, you know, we'll have to see how it fits into videos and that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, that will be a much better fit than any of the current narrative stuff would have been. Because now, like, we sometimes we'd film, and, like, we're just filming in my basement, right? And it's just the two of us. And sometimes we'll be, like, filming or we'll be editing something, and we'll be like, man, like, is this still interesting? Like, we're just filming the same video over and over, really. <laughs> um, and, like, yeah, it's different teams and different die rolls, but... Sometimes it feels like the same thing over and over. But now I almost feel like there are so many topics. There are so many like angles we could come at it from that mm. we're spoiled for choice a little bit. It's like, what do we want to do first? You know? And, I, you know, I'm, I'm really excited by that. Likewise. Yeah, I'm pretty excited to see what comes with the new edition. Like, obviously, we're all to all four of us are pretty hyped, it feels like. And yeah. I'm really looking forward to getting my hands on the Vespid because after seeing them that Nova, those Vespid models are sick. Because when oh, I was a yeah. kid, those models were terrible. So I'm really looking <laughs> forward to uh, seeing them. They're huge, seeing... too. I didn't realize this, but like when we were walking around Nova, they had um, painters there out in the open, just like preparing the minis, and they're huge. Like yeah. they they look way smaller on the internet, but when you actually see them in person, they're yeah. they're quite large. I hope yeah. they don't have the like void dancer problem where they're extremely top heavy and their wings get caught on stuff and they tip over. But time will tell. Yeah, time will tell. Right as the tempester is hot drop into the kill zone and stab <laughs> a couple people on the way down. Yeah. Uh, you that know, looks fun. If they are top heavy, quick hobby tip. Uh, and what I did with my void dancers is I glued some washers to the bottom of the base just to add a bunch of weight there, and it makes them so much like more stable and easy to move around. Yeah, it's smart. When I was a kid, I used to put nickels in the bases just because it like felt better. But it's cheaper than washers. It. Yeah, true. Oh man. All right, Brad and Vic from Mountainside. Thanks for coming on to the podcast and talking about the new edition and all the stuff we're excited for. Yeah, thanks for having us. It was a blast.
Yes. And thank you, listeners, for listening until the end. <laughs>